Kia ora. Welcome back to Video Drones. I'm Hannah Hart. And I'm Nick Hart. How you all doing? Hope your Friday's going well. Sorry if my energy levels are a bit low. I had my third vaccination a couple of days ago and I just slept all yesterday. Feeling totally wiped out. Awful, but yeah, better than getting COVID, eh? Well, getting it badly. So we have spent this last week doing some deep diving into the world of... Iskil Vogt. Is Iskil Vogt, um, who did The Innocence, which recently came out. It was in the Cannes Film Festival, a Norwegian film. It's amazing. You've got to see it. Um, um, we've also looked at his earlier film, Blind, which is very good. He's only done one other film, which is mm. crazy, uh, because he's just so incredibly talented. And there's actually quite a big story around why he hasn't done more films, even though he's always wanted to be a director. Um, he, yeah, he... He just found it very difficult in the 90s to get um, money and access to um, to film stock, which is how most films were shot back then. Um, so he ended up collaborating with his friend Joaquin Trier as a writer, because you know he thought that was something you could just do by yourself in a room without any money. Um, so yeah, they've done five films together. They did um, Reprise. Oslo, August 31st, Louder Than Bombs, Thelma, and The Worst Person in the World, which we recently saw at the movies. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, quite well received by the world, The Worst Person in the World. I thought the story was really good. I'm not such a big fan of the execution, though, I've got to say. No, neither am I of mm. Tria's um, films, really. Yeah. There's just something a bit, um, I don't know, a bit bland and a bit smug, smug about the characters as well. Maybe it's him, his own personality coming through. Mm. Well, that's quite a harsh call, but yeah. It was quite a harsh call, but we've got to say we much prefer the work of Vogt to um, Joachim Trier, who's a distant relative of Lars von Trier, though they are very, mm. they should not be considered in the same category. Yeah. Uh, his film films are you know generally very well received though they're always very yeah. very highly rated but that's just us this is just us we're just a bit more finicky than most i think we notice things um in a different way from other people perhaps but yeah he's just kind of got this smugness this kind of like i'm patting myself on my back how great this is his characters are really unlikable as well so mm, i don't know i'm not a big fan of his work much more of a fan of vokt who's mm. kind of been in his shadow for a long time and we're hoping that the innocents will overcome that hopefully yeah. there seems to be some serious nepotism in norwegian filmmaking if you don't come from a filmmaking family you don't get to make films which is wow that's extremely limiting uh mm. his other film blind which we watched um which has got the same main actress um that is in the innocents is a very conceptual film you sort of described it as mm, yeah yeah he's he said that his own early short films were very conceptual and abstract um which is something you see in blind a lot more as well um but he has said that he's trying to make an effort to sort of make more entertaining films and you know the the innocence is more of a it's sort of angling towards genre film and that it can be considered a horror film as well. And funnily enough, they don't want it to be considered as a horror film. They want it considered more as like a thriller, I think. Mm. Uh, but it has all of the elements of horror. Though I suppose if you stick it in the genre of horror, sometimes people just don't really take it that seriously, which would be a shame because this film really does sort of transcend the genre. <laughs> people we might even call it elevated horror elevated term, hate right? that term really hate but it is it's elevated as, as hell it's it's um yeah it's some next level I, i've got to say though if you find animal cruelty really hard to watch you're probably mm. not gonna be able to stomach this so in 25 minutes and there's a scene of extreme cruelty towards a lovely little cat mm. um which I is found it very difficult to watch very difficult to watch and then there's cruelty that happens to children and adults and that's also very very hard to watch so it's sort of playing on our worst fears really it really is um blind i really really like blind i thought it was really clever and one scene there's the two men that are talking to each other and then you think hang on are they on a bus or in a cafe because from one view 
there's sort of, they're sort of on a bus and on the other viewpoint they're in a cafe and the way that these sort of realities intertwine is really fascinating and it, it, he, I think the themes that he explores in the innocence he sort of starts bringing about in blind which is about people's interpretation of the world they're in the way they explore the world the way they sense the world which he really gets into with the innocence so I can see some of those themes that were starting to get developed in blind coming through more and the innocence same with Thelma um, he's sort of exploring these it's his not his film but I like that I like the story a lot and some of the cinematography was actually quite similar to the innocence so Thelma was about a young woman that starts to manifest these sort of powers um, it's not your usual kind of like psychokinetic powers it's more an ability to will things into happening um, so there's these sort of supernatural themes coming through in Thelma which is what he, what he wrote and then there's the sort of strange things of um, kind of connecting to another mind that's happening in blind that he's really really gone into with with the innocence uh, so I suppose to describe the film a little bit um, without giving too much away it's uh, sort of structured around these four children aging from about eight or nine years old to just under prepubescent but I think he deliberately um, Vocht it, it deliberately didn't want to use prepubescent children because that's kind of another stage of childhood. This is the sort of innocent sort of period. And one of the characters, Anna, she's actually she has she has autism. So she's even though she's slightly older than the other three, she has that innocence about her. So we've got Anna and Ida who are sisters, and then there's Ben and Aisha, and these children are just incredible actors. Um, absolutely mind-blowing and mm. there was quite a process I was like, how the hell did he do this because the children were too young to see the film and they don't and you know how did he get these performances out of these children you know I've seen a lot of films with children and it's rare to see a really talented child actor but all four of these children are just exceptional um, but the actually that the part casting process took a year and a half and involved thousands of children so Vogt went all over the country trying to find the right children for the film he uh, he left it quite open as to the background and the gender of some of the children because originally it was supposed to be two brothers instead of two sisters so they've kind of been quite open with um, yeah, just they, they wanted to find the right fit rather than have a specific idea of what they wanted and then there was a three month workshop with these children and they weren't actually allowed to read the entirety of the scripts these children they only read like little parts their lines so it was a, a really involved process to make it a safe and fun sort of experience for these children who were also taught the acting acting basics and uh, they were neither of them none, none of them were really actors they just sort of fit mm. these characters and Anna the uh, autistic child is very well done I mean the it's very hard to get autis autism right, especially non-verbal autism in films. But this is actually no complaints. This is actually yeah, very, very, very good. good. Yeah, it's not doesn't disintegrate into kind of cliches or um, sort of over. I don't know. It's hard to describe. But there's a lot of kind of cliches that come about with being mm. autistic and mannerisms and behaviours and sounds. But um, Anna nails that. I don't, and it was actually like, gee, did that she is an autistic child for this? But of course, that would have been really impossible. While we're talking about children in the film, I I don't know if you found this out, but was this? Um, I mean, there's a film from the early '60s called The Innocence. Is this any relation to that? I mean, did he base it sort of on that? Was that's more of a gothic horror? It's black and white, and it's sort of very stylized, and it's which is a great performance by Deborah Kerr. So it's more about adults as well. I guess this has a little bit of that, but, um, you know, they're both called The Innocents, so there must be some correlation. Well, some people have compared it to The Turning of the, sh the Screw, which is about these young children in a, a, a home, and then this nanny comes into it, and it well, actually sort of is based on Bly Manor as well, The Haunting of Bly Manor. Hmm. So probably there is some sort of connection. I suppose some people have compared it to Firestarter and Carrie and movies like that. Hmm. But I think it completely kicks everybody's ass. It's amazing. <laughs> but like I said, there's some scenes of immense cruelty, which are really, really hard to watch. Very disturbing. Very realistic. Very too, too realistic. Um, and so I guess he has that a bit in common with Tarkovsky as well. Hmm. I haven't really talked about influences, but I would just quickly say that um, Tarkovsky's 
Storker and Mirror uh, influences, which you can see in the um, al alchemy, alchemical magic of the everyday and, uh, and a fascination with nature and the elements. Mm. And um, of course, he loves Hitchcock, which we can feel through their mutual obsession with suspense. And um, Box considers Elaine Renee and Marguerite Duras major influences, especially their collaboration Hiroshima and Mon Amour, which is one of my favourite films. Um, Renee's, Renee's a aim of filming thoughts and memories can be seen in Blind and to a lesser extent in The Innocence. Um, mm. Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now, which we watched recently, it was, I think it was your first time seeing that. Yes, um, that was really good. It's also an influence mm. which we see in the fact that you could consider them both formalist art films and moving dramas, but at the same time they're, they're quite suspenseful and scary horror films. Mm. You know, it's sort of a multi-category film, really. Um, Claire Denis and her cinematographer Agnes Goddard's influence can be seen in the risks taken in storytelling and form, for example, the use of ellipsis, and especially in Blind. Mm. And finally, Kubrick is visually a huge influence, which you can kind of see in the Yeah, innocence. you can definitely see that, yeah. And um, interestingly, Elaine, Ellen Dorrit Peterson who's the main actor in Blind, and she's one of the adult um, actors in The Innocence. She was the daughter of Leon Vitelli, who's the acted in Mary Linden, and was Kubrick's personal assistant from The Shining onwards. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. I think, um, I think that uh, he was very, very excited when he found that out, because he's such a big Kubrick mm. fan. Seeing through, going through the list of um, Vox's uh, favourite films was quite exciting because many of them we also really, really love. Except for the Woody Allen film, film like... Yeah, Annie Hall. Annie Hall, yuck. I but mean, but mm. I can see that, you know, he's, he's quite... <laughs> we've only seen two of his films, but he's very interested in um, relationships. Mm, which makes sense. And everything they entail. And, and, you know, Woody Allen is kind of the relationship director really I'd say and also um, fellow Scandinavian Ingmar Bergman mm. is also sort of almost like a you know a counterpart to Woody Allen's American um, relationship films but um, you can see Bergman as an obvious influence but also Christoph Kieslowski in his film uh, film sort of a TV series called Decalogue which a lot, a lot of people consider his masterpiece um, which is like Blind and The Innocence, set in a sort of a high-rise apartment building. Mm. And that's, yeah, a great, great series. Well, I, I think of it as a series of short films. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, he's influenced by some of the greats. And luckily, those influences can be seen and he has translated them really well. Mm. When I saw The Innocence the first time, I actually couldn't breathe for parts of it. Uh, I've never had such a visceral reaction to a film ever, which is saying a lot because I like to watch a lot of horror and a lot of thriller, anything psychological, anything that sort of gets you around the edge of your seat. But this is a whole nother level. Like I actually thought I was going to pass out for a <laughs> bit there and then I got really like headed and I couldn't move and I got mm, tingly all over. It felt over. quite tense in the theatre when we watched it. It's, it's just, you're just holding your breath. I think the whole entire audience was just like, <gasps> or right on the edge of their seats. The level of tension in this just, is so intense and it just keeps building and building and building. It's a masterwork of tension, um, utilising these fantastic young actors and they just don't seem like they're acting, it doesn't seem like there's any cameras there, I don't know how they achieve this. It's just very difficult to do with kids. Incredibly difficult. Um, so yeah, it's a very visceral experience, it's very, very intense and it did remind me of seeing The Shining for the first time, like that level of like horror and suspense and I was amazed to see something that actually managed to kind of supersede that to some degree, which The Innocence actually did. And so in that respect, that might be one of my favourite films of all time. And it was really interesting watching it with my 18-year-old son because mm. we have very similar tastes. And he also said, gee, that might be the best film I've ever seen. Mm. Um, he said that Midsommar uh, restored his faith in cinema. <laughs> so he's already a bit of a snob, which is great. It works really well for us. Um, but it's interesting because Vop actually wrote this film when he had children of his own because he started, it sort of made him remember about how children experience things. And that's a really interesting part of the film is the way that children interact with their environment. Um, and my son was saying the same thing, like there's moments where characters are kind of like 
you know, investigating a scab or interacting mm. with a stream of water or playing with some sand with like a broken blue bead in it. And that sort of took me right back what, to what it's like to experience life as a child, the way that you interact and explore and sense your environment. There's all these like little things. And it, and it does, it just made, my, my son, even though he's only 10, he's only 18, he said, yeah, it really reminded him of being a child again. That, that the same stuff for me. reminds me a lot of Tarkovsky. Yes, well. Tarkovsky makes you see the world like new again. Even, you know, like um, young girls playing with cups and things like mm. the Stalker. You know, that, that sort of sprinkled through all of his films. Yes, and Teresa, is it Teresa? Thelma. Thelma. <laughs> Thelma, they, there's a scene with milk and blood and, a, and the girl levitating. I was like, man, this is so influenced by Tarkovsky. And mm. It is. So, of course, that's his writing. That's sort of his input. And I thought they were the best parts of the film. There's also the interaction of people with nature. It's so interesting that this is set in Oslo. But as well, it's like the, it's in the outskirts of Oslo where nature and sort of people meet. And there's a big, all these big apartment buildings. So there's a lot about the interaction of people with nature. In fact, when when the family, the original you know, the family we first meet, which is Anna and Ida's family, first get to this place, um, Ida's looking at these shadows, and it's almost like this creepy witch with long fingers, mm. which is from the sh from the forest. And and then sort of we start to get into like so when these children all meet each other, they start manifesting these powers. And what I liked about it was how subtle these powers are and how unsurprised they kind of are with these powers they're just like oh cool you know like that anything else that they're experiencing i don't think they realize just how unusual it is which is a really nice way to do things but there's almost sometimes i do think at, at times there's something to do with the forest and their ability to manifest these these powers um i felt like there was like a little hint of that but it's very hard to say what it is exactly that's helping them manifest these powers except for when they're together their powers get stronger so we don't know if this is happening with other children uh, in the area but it is the summer holidays and most of the children are away so you've just got the small group of children left um, and of course at this time of year in Norway there's a lot of sunlight so that was a really interesting factor to this film in that you couldn't have it at night time mm -hmm. because night time comes really 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 late so most of this horror is during the day and being able to make the day daytime that yeah. intense and scary is no small feat I guess that she is that with uh, midsummer as well yes yeah yeah it's all mm. in the light which is really a lot more frightening and unsettling yeah. but it's much much harder to achieve that uh so the big theme of this movie is sort of empathy and cruelty sort of destruction and creation uh it's about children or there's all underlying it all i guess it's also exploring the concept of are we born or are we made into what we become because, you know, like Ben in particular, he's kind of like the villain of this film, but he does come from a home full of abuse and neglect. Mm. And you think, well, maybe he's suggesting that he wasn't born that way. He was maybe made that way. And then you've got um, Aisha's family, her mother, she's got a solo mother. I think something's happened to the dad. He's not present anymore. The mother seems to be suffering from quite a deep depression is often crying. So I think Aisha's developed this sort of empathy, which you see very strongly come out in the film and then but then you've got Ida and Anna and Ida is a really cruel child she has very cruel leanings that's why she sort of becomes friends with Ben and they do some terrible things together a lot of cruelty in this film really. so much cruelty but the thing is children can be really cruel mm, yeah it's uh, yeah they it's can totally be valid children can be immensely cruel to each other to animals um that's something that I think a lot of people don't want to acknowledge but children can be very very cruel or they can be very very empathetic and it's interesting with Anna and Ida because their parents are quite normal, but you know, one child's quite cruel and one's not. And so it's, it's sort of, I mean, I've always kind of thought it's a bit of both. You're born with a certain predisposition for some things like ADHD, which I discovered, uh, uh, but you also, a lot about how you're raised can influence who you become. So, you know, I think I would have been a lot worse if I wasn't raised in the way I was because I sort of had quite a strict set of morals and boundaries that kept me from going too crazy, which my ADHD wanted me to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I do think it's a really interesting, it's a very psychological film, extremely psychological in that it really just dives deep into the um, the psyche of these children and perhaps how they became this way. Um, yeah, uh, 
the parenting style, the parents, I love how that was incorporated. The parents were so really good actors, but the, the four children were the stars of the of the film. Mm, Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about the music? Oh, well, gosh, <laughs> the music is such an important part mm. of the film. It's very sparsely used. Very minimal. Very minimal, sparsely used. it needs used. to be. Okay. Yeah, I, I, they, they just nailed the sound. And the, the sound design becomes mm. kind of much more of a part of it than the actual um, music. You know, the sound of like, you know, a ball hitting the ground or a head thumping against a wall or, you know, the sounds that come into, and this just this, all the little rustling sounds of things, the sound design is really, really important. But the music, when it is there, is amazing. It's by um, a chap called Pissi Levanto. He's just amazing. And he, he does a lot of- a lot of Norwegian films. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's very good. We saw an interview with him. He's a very, very interesting person. Um, he basically had to sort of create a new genre of music for this film, and they called it Nordic Art House Thriller Music. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and he incorporates graphic scores as well, which has sort of been a, a thing in, you know, contemporary classical music, of just sort of like drawing um, shapes to and sort of getting the, the musicians to interpret the sort of marks on the score. Yeah, very unusual and innovative. I saw he was sort of composing and sort of um, directing these and, uh, stringed instruments, people playing stringed instruments, and they had this, these strange sort of circular circles with dashes of colour in them, and he mm. kind of gets the um, musicians to interpret these colours yeah. and this rhythm, which creates a really amazing effect. And what he did, he wanted to create something that really demonstrated the innocence of children that had been tainted by adulthood. So in that, And so he took all these beautiful sounds that were quite unusual, and then he sort of modified them a lot and played them at half speed which gave mm. this quite eerie sense and then he also used um a guy called Mika Kalio's idea I don't think he actually worked directly with him but this guy uses gongs he's very experimental gamelins, gamelins yeah. and gongs and he was from Helsinki I think oh that makes sense yeah, yeah. they yeah. couldn't collaborate all the time so they sort of sent each other things but it looks like yeah. they did work in the studio once to you know record them properly yeah, so those gongs became a really part, important part of Ben's theme. So the music mm. is a character in itself. It's so, so beautifully done. And the cinematography by Stella Brunth. Mm. Gee. Yeah, he's, he's done some interesting films. He is, I think he won quite a few awards for Victoria, which is a film set all in one night. Mm. Um, yeah, it's quite sort of highly regarded, that film. Um, and he's also done some films with, um, God, what's the guy's name? He's a collaborator of Lars von Trier. They did a, just did a film recently called Another Round with Mads Mikkelsen, which is, you know, getting a lot of good ratings and reviews oh, Mads, from people. Mads is so good. He's mm. so good in The Hunt. If you haven't seen The Hunt, you should watch that. He's just incredible. Not to mention mm. his performances as Hannibal and Hannibal. We have a lot of love for Mads. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, anything else to add? Not from me. Do you want to rate it? I'm giving it five out of five, easy. <laughs> like, if I could, I'd give it 100%. 100%. I, I, I loved it. it. It messed me up, but I loved it. I think it's absolutely amazing, and I really hope that Vogue gets a lot more attention and acclaim after this and gets to make all the films he wants mm, to. That'd yeah. be great. Well, I'm giving it a, a four. Four? So it gets nine. So altogether. it gets nine. Yay! Yeah. That's good. Yeah, he really deserves it. Um, very excited about his future as a director, finally, mm. and hoping that we get to see a lot more of his work in the future. Mm. So, yeah, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next Friday. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.